Lifestyle Pirates with Big J and Adriano. Okay, good morning and welcome to Lifestyle Pirates with me, Big J, and him, Adriano. All right. This morning we're joined here by Anthony Maniscalco. Oh, wow. Did I do it right? That was great. It did it well. It's oh, good. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased. I'm Got pleased. it in one. Uh, otherwise known as, as Coach. Um, mate, good morning. Good welcome. morning. Morning, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Hey, you're looking a bit dusty. Are you all right? Oh, mate, I am dusty. <laughs> <laughs> But like seven liters of water on the table. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but it's not uh, alcohol driven. It's yeah. uh, it, it's it's work driven. So yeah, we had a corporate fight night last night. That was yeah. a late night. It was a very late night. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we pulled up the stumps at about two. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so we had, I think we had about fifteen fights, which I cornered with, with the team there, and um, yeah, so that was a very late fights night. Fights in one night. Yeah, fifteen, one after the other, and then um, into the after party because they all want to celebrate, and then you know, so I'm trying to like. Avoid beers and <laughs> I'm, I'm accepting going, thanks guys. And then, you know, I think one guy gave me a shot and I did the odd over the shoulder. Thanks. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's always going to be a short night when you're on shots. So but what's, um, I'm going to hear you first. What was the most tragic, uh, walkout song of oh, the nice. night? Uh, mate, there was, you know, it was, it was colloquial. It was like a, a colonial, I should say. It was an Irish number. Yeah. But no one knew what the fuck it was. <laughs> and this guy's backstage and he's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm trying to be there with him, you know, and then next thing, you know, he goes out and the room's kind of like half silent because no one knows what the song was, yeah, exactly. you know. Exactly, so flatly comes out. It's yeah, the most, yeah, something like that, yeah. Thing, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, <laughs> Sorry, I just swore, I'm allowed to swear on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it, it just, make, just comes sure out. That. If not, it's a drink talking, it's okay. Well, that's fucking all right then. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your walkout song? Oh, mine's, um, my, when I fight, my walkout song is Victory by, by uh, um, Notorious B.I.G. Oh, nice. Yeah, so everyone loves a bit of biggie. Yeah, I'm, John knows. I always, I train to hip hop. It's my, it's my angry zone out music. Yeah, there. yeah. So you don't find it too slow? No, no. Um, I, I think, um, for me, I, I actually zone out when I'm training. Mm. And so, and I channel aggression and I channel uh, the stresses and the highs and lows in life, mm. and, and it all comes out when I'm training, and um, that's what happens when I'm when I'm boxing. So for me, victory has a really long build up. And it, it, it's pretty special to me because my walkout means something to me because every fight means something to me. Mm -hmm. And so my story behind boxing is very deep. Um, and it has a really long intro. And so usually I'm the last one to walk out. Mm. Um, that tension. Well, it keeps my opponent waiting in the ring. So. <laughs> <laughs> on your time. <laughs> on my time, yeah. So I walk out on my time and, you know, sometimes my coach looks at me and just goes, mate, are you going to go? And I'm like, I'll go when I'm ready, mate. <laughs> <You> know, just, <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and so it's a bit of a tribal for me. It's almost like a tribal feeling. Yeah, you, know, you get out there and ready to go to war. Yeah, yeah. that's so awesome. Sounds violent, but I'm not violent. No, yeah. no. Well, it's a boxing ring, so yeah. I just love fighting. <laughs> <laughs> I love violence, I love fighting. In the in the ring, though, yeah. <laughs> you know. But um, well, didn't Biggie say I'm not a player? I just fuck a lot. Yeah, yeah. pretty it's much. Yeah. Thing, eh? yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I reserve the comment on that <laughs> 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 on the grounds that I may incriminate myself. <laughs> So great start. So for the un for the uneducated. Yeah, good morning. <laughs> what's uh, what's corporate fighter for the uneducated? Um, so corporate fighter is um, it's just this awesome program that um, takes everyday people um, out of their jobs and out of their everyday lives and throws them into the gym, um, and we throw them straight into the deep end into a twelve week program, um, boxing. Mm -hmm. So the majority of, of them have never boxed before and. and shitting themselves when they walk in the gym and see the ring and see us coaches standing out the front. And we essentially have 12 weeks to turn them into some sort of a fighter. Um, and then we pair them up within the program against each other. Yeah. And so mentally they're preparing to fight each other. They don't find out until the, the, the day of the fight. Um, and, yeah, so we take them all through the motions and through the processes and then we pair them up and weigh them up. And, you know, and, and the, the final product is we're, we're governed by league boxing here in, in New South Wales and, um, it, it is recognised as an amateur fight mm. on their fight card, so they get you know, registered as boxers um, and fighters, combat sports athletes. And um, but it is a corporate show, and so we raise money for, for charities as well. So it's very much a corporate fundraising show. Um, every show has a different charity and is backed by a different charity. Um, you know, last night was Beyond Blue, Beyond Blue again it's tonight. Charity. Yeah, great charity. Yeah. So um, so I really believe in it from from that aspect, and also. Um, just the mental 
journey that I see mm. through through all my fighters and majority of people come in the gym and they walk in and they're just they're just fucked up from something in life. Mm-hmm. You know, they've just gone through something in life. It could be a relationship issue. Um, they could have lost someone. They could have just gone off the rails in life in general. You know, and I've seen guys just come in former drug addicts and literally just got off some program and they leave our program and it's just miraculous. They're just mm. – they're cured. Yeah. You know, they're ready to go and they're still in the gym today after their fight and they come in and they love it and it becomes very much like a, f- a family environment, you know. So the product is um, – you know, I'm a big advocate for it. I've been there for six years. Yeah. Um, and so I, I do believe in it because I see what comes out of it and I guess I'm a little bit of a product from it, from boxing. I started in boxing um, before Cobra Fighter. Yeah. About a year before. Um, and so – yeah, and so I, I went through my own highs and lows. Mm-hmm. And uh, coming out the other end, boxing kind of saved me in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. You know? um, and it's that sort of sport and anyone will tell you, anyone in the sport, is that when you're having a bad day, you know, chips are down and the odds are against you, you just get in that ring or the gym and just pound away at that bag and let it all out. And as soon as you come out, you're dripping in sweat and you hate the whole process but you feel amazing afterwards, yeah? yeah? Like up here and in here, you know? And... Um, so for me, that's that, that's the most rewarding part, you know. And then you get get to fight night like last night, and you see the guys in the ring, you know. And I remember there's one particular guy, uh, you know, and um, he couldn't even couldn't even put two steps together when he started. And you know, I was really concerned for him stepping in the ring, and I won't name him, but he gets in there last night and he actually boxed for the first round. He looked like a boxer, hmm. and I just had a, one of those moments where. I, I call it a fuck me moment. Like, yeah. and I used to have him in my cafe when we were like pumping and cranking and there's people everywhere and, and I'd step back and watch my team just going for it and coffee's pouring and I'd step back and, you know, one one day I just my manager said to me, all right, and I was just going, fuck me, and it became known as a fuck me moment. So, yeah. so I, I had that last night and I'm like, fuck, where did this come from? Yeah. Like, have a look at him. It's just so good. Yeah. Like, you know, and, like he lost the fight but – that's only because he didn't have enough in the gas tank, you know. Yeah. But he just did so and I was really proud, you know. And at the end of it, they all come up and, you know, they, they thank us as coaches. And when they thank you for not only for teaching them how to box and, and giving them the courage to do that, but they also thank you for getting them through that journey. Yeah. It's it's just a wonderful feeling, you know. It's very, very young fulfilling for me. So who's it aimed at? Anyone. Anyone can do it? Anyone. Because it says corporate. What if you're a mechanic? You're a corporate mechanic, aren't you? Yeah, I suppose I could be, but any just anyone. Sorry, you are a mechanic. Yeah, I'm yeah, a mechanic. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just just figured that that's where it came from. Yeah. It could be anyone, yeah. anyone. Corporate is is big, I guess, business. Yeah, yeah. So that's just, I guess, that's the word for um, white collar boxing, mm. and um, even white collar is probably incorrect because we've got. I mean, we had a concrete fight last night. You know, we had. That was it. Uh, yeah, it was hard. Uh, he was no. He was. <laughs> that was appalling joke. <laughs> that was appalling joke. <laughs> he was. He was hard, but he had us there to reinforce him. Yeah. Hey. So he didn't, hey, you got that one. Didn't he didn't you? get flattened. <laughs> Sorry. He didn't get flattened. No, nah, he got smoothed out. Oh no. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting we're getting like real deep here with yeah. these jokes. Here. <laughs> and they're not good. No. <laughs> well, my, I don't see you giving anything to this. Well, stand by. We've still got time. We've still got time. Well, my excuse is I'm a father, so I've got the best dad jokes yeah. in the world. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned you've obviously done a few fights and, and boxing kind of saved you a little bit. Yeah. I mean, tell us about tell us about that because we were talking before we press record and you, were, you used to have been to your football or soccer. Yeah, so I played um, soccer or football all my life, um, you know, and, and I played at a fairly decent level, you know, and um, injury stops you. As always with that sport, and ankles and knees blew out, and um, I just started training in the gym and hit classes, and then um, I was in my cafe, which I'm sure we'll get into later. Um, and I had a very good friend of mine come in, and he's a he's a boxing martial arts coach, and he was putting on a, a show, and for a uh, a kick kickboxing a title defense fight for one of his his boys, and um, he was putting together an amateur show and he just wanted to do novices to come straight in and go straight into the amateurs. Very similar to the corporate program but it was this was all about fighting. Yeah. Um, and so he was in in the bar and I'm at the bar and making coffee and whatnot and they're all starting to egg me on and like, you should do it, you should do it and, you know, you always tell me how you train and you should do it. I'm like, no, guys, I can't do it. There's no, I'm a dad and it's business and, you know, and so 
that's me to a T. I'm always no, and then I just have a claim it to myself. Think, well, why the hell can't I do it? Mm. I like to be outside of my comfort zone, and mm. so it, was, it resonated with me. And then I just couldn't stop thinking about it. And then I pretty much made up my mind, but I was being, I was in denial. And I'm like, nah, I'm not going to do it. He comes in the next day and he goes, "You're doing it, aren't you?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "I saw the look in your eye." <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I signed up for that fight. Um, and at that point in time, there was a boxing gym across the road from from my um, cafe, and the boys used to come in all the time. Um, and so Jeff Fennick, he's a very good friend of mine. Hey Jeff, <laughs> he won't mind me saying so. He he used to train a lot of his boys there, and so his head trainer Basil, um, who's my coach today, um, used to come in. And so I walk in their gym, and I'm like, they laughed at me. Like, what are you doing? You know, guys, you've got a fight in twelve weeks. You've got twelve weeks to turn me into a fighter. Baz goes. No way. He turns around to the other trainers and goes, this guy's got a fight. <laughs> so he pulls the ring ropes up and goes, well, get the fuck in here then. So <laughs> <laughs> we got a lot of work to do. Yeah, we got a lot of work. So I, I, I started and so I trained with the guys in that program and then I just got stuck into it and mm. I trained and it was very easy for me because it was right across the road from mm. from my little bar and so I'd finish work and I'd go straight to training and it was every day. I just started. Mm. So I started to discover that life you know, and then I started eating cleaner. Um, I cut the beer out, I cut all the, you know, the alcohol out and I, I went straight into f- what we call fight camp. You know, that was my first one and, and it was a growing experience for me. Um, and so I'm training for this fight. I was going to be at Dalton House in the city. And then I didn't know what to think, what to expect. And then so at that time my father was quite ill. He, um, he had a, a quadruple bypass. On, and so when they opened him up, he, um, they found a tumour resting on his heart. And so they... He was in there for hours and I remember being in RPA at four in the morning. Doctor comes out and goes, look, it's, it's all good. It went really well. He, you know, it was a triple, not a quadruple and he's going to heal up fine, whatever. But I did find something else and I found this tumour the size of my fist just resting on his heart. Yeah, and so he told him cut it, cut it off and whatever. And so then from that, to fast forward that story, dad went into the fight of his life, um, which ultimately took it, and that was cancer. And so it ended up, they traced it and he had liver cancer. And so... Um, so, yeah, that, he was fighting cancer f- basically throughout that whole period and, and for the last 12 weeks of what we, what would be his life, unbeknownst to me, was the same time that I, I signed up to do this fight. So two days before the fight, Dad passed. Jesus. Yeah, and so, um, yeah, this is, told you it was deep. So <laughs> a couple of years ago, I'd be in a mess right now. But yeah. Um, so I just, I, I channeled that and all my anger towards that. And my dad's journey, I just thought, well, if dad's going to fight this thing, I'm going to fight this thing too, you know. So I started raising some money um, for the Chris O'Brien Lifehouse, which is who was treating him. I still raise money for them today. Um, and so, I, you know, I didn't raise a lot, but I, I, I did, bit. did yeah. my bit, you know. And then so I remember sitting, dad passed and obviously I'm out of the fight and everyone's, you know, sending condolences and I'm sitting with mum after all the relatives had all taken off one night and I'd organised a funeral. And it was all done. And so... I sat there and, you know, and I'm consulting mum and I went quiet and she said, you're all right? I said, yeah, I'm good, mum, but there's something I've got to finish. And she said, I thought this was coming. She said, go and do it. Just don't come back hurt. <laughs> I said, I can't guarantee that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, she said, can you do it? I said, mum, I, I think I'm okay at this stuff. And she said, no problem. So, you know, and that's trying to convince an Italian mother. <laughs> That I'm, just, I'm about, to, you know, your father's just passed and some bloke's about to punch the shit out of you, <laughs> you know. And so I was very surprised at mum and, you know, she's she's the, probably one of the strongest people that I know. And, um, hey, mum. <laughs> <laughs> she knows I'm here, by the way. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so I went in and uh, I went into the fight night and, you know, a cousin picked me up there in the house full of relatives and I grab my boxing bag and I take off and, you know, and they're all. Half of them are crying and whatever. And so mm-hmm. I get there and I got there just in time for my fight, not the show, nothing. And I just walked straight in, changed up, warmed up, went out, did it. Um, I did okay. I, I think I lost. Um, yeah, I did. Most definitely lost, yeah. So you came second. Sorry? Came second? No, nah, there's no second, mate. You just lost. So <laughs> <laughs> that's the competitor in me. Um, and so, yeah, but it was really nice. They had a one-minute silence for Dad and, you know, they organised all this stuff and so, and I felt good afterwards and, mm. and then so that that's the story. And then so to get back to the gym, the guy said, you know, while I'm training for it, after this fight we're never going to see you again. I said, oh, I wouldn't be so sure about that because I was hooked. 
mm. you know. And then I just, I just knew how it made me feel, and I knew what it was doing. And then so I just carried forward with it and never stopped. You know, and a year later I discovered corporate fighter, signed up for another fight, and um, had my first corporate fight, and then. And then I, then I just filled in, did another one, and thereafter I, was, I went straight into the amateurs. And so I represented the gym at amateur level um, in the ring and fought other gyms, you know. So often enough, if they needed to fill a fight on the card and they didn't have enough, that, you know, uh, Josh King, who, who is the corporate fighter, approached me and said, Would you like to fight? And I said, Sure, no problem, you know. And I never say no and back down. And yeah, so I've had some wins, some losses, and yeah, and that's kind of. That's the boxing story, you know. And that's kind of how I fell into it, but I fell into it through coffee. So, there's a segue for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, what is so what does boxing give you? <clears throat> does it? I mean, does it give you an escape? What 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 keeps you going back? And certainly, actually, to the fight side of things as well. Um, not just the training, but the fights. Oh look, I, I've grown to love the life. It's such a clean. Um, journey and it's unnatural like my last fight I walked out at 69.5 kilos I wasn't born it that way mm. you know and so it's unnatural but the, the mental toughness that you develop to get to that weight and to get to that point because you've got to make weight or else you can't fight um, it's just it, it's just an awesome drive for me you know and then you, you suddenly your body reacts to it and so I love my beer like anyone else and um you know, it takes some mental strength to go to the pub with your mates and drink water, you know, and order a piece of chicken that's this big and some salad, you know. Yeah. Um, and so, but I feel a million bucks after training, you know, mm. and, I, and, and, I, and I cure myself and I leave it all in the gym and um, and that's the way I train, you know. I train like an animal, which is my fight name, which is kind of how I got the name. Um, <laughs> there's another story to that, which is funnier. But <laughs> the guff tools off. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I fight a bit like him, yeah. <laughs> even though he was a soccer player. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, the journey for me is is really rewarding physically and mentally, you know. And so as your body starts to develop and change and, and you get to that peak, which is where your coach wants you to get to that peak, when you stay at that peak for about a week, that's when you're ready to go, you know. So you get to that peak a week out and then you taper into the fight and all your energy is there and you're ready to go. So the whole journey for me um, is exciting and I just love it. You know, and but there's a goal at the end, you know, and at the end of it, um, there's nothing. You build up to this climax, and you have the fight, and and then you wake up the next day, and suddenly you don't have to, you don't have to pack your bag, you don't have to get back to the gym, you don't have to do anything. You can just get back on the beers if you want. But mm. I've become computed to to not do that, and, mm. and so for me, I'm like, well, next day I'm back in the gym. You know, um, my coach would say, well, "What are you doing here, brother? Go and." You've, you've done it, mate. Go mm. and, you know, this is my place, my happy place. Mm. It becomes my happy place. Mm -hmm. I never really had a happy place in life, you know, other than home because mm. mum's pasta is so good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and but, is that why you started the coaching side of things then? Is that why you've, yeah, well, you've I guess, kind of transitioned to – I guess it's so just – you can still keep going back? Um, not really, no, because I was there anyway. Mm. And so um, – You can live that journey with them as well. 100%, yeah, and so – with Corporate Fighter, I um I became a support staff member there and I would support the fighters and attend the fight nights and warm them up and, um, you know, I wouldn't fight every fight night. Um, and then it, throughout the gym, it's, it's such a mental struggle for these guys because it's really unnatural, like I say, for them. I've become, become accustomed to it, so it's part of my life now. I live like that, you know. And, um, and so for me as a support crew member, to, to develop myself into a coach when the, the offer came and um, to coach, I, I didn't think twice about it, you know. And it's kind of it's kind of removed some of the fire in the belly to fight. It's kind of filled that void for me. I mm. feel like I've done what I need to do in the ring, mm. um, you know. And But not to say I, I, I won't fight again because I don't know, you know, because I do love fighting. Yeah. I actually love the whole process and how, how calm I am in the lead up to the fight and the fight night, you know, I see these guys last night and, you know, and I've seen amateur fighters just shitting themselves before the fight and I'm just so calm yeah. it's because I'm ready. And even when I wasn't ready, I'm just calm. And, and, and I've developed that confidence within myself to know that I get, I, I'm good enough to get out there and defend myself 
at the very, very least. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, so I never go out there. I always think I'm, I'll go out there to win. Yeah. But I never go out there expecting to win. I know that I've got to work for it, you know. And my last fight really taught me that that was my, my hardest one. Mm. Um, you know, because they're all half my age, you know. And half the time I'm thinking, I'm fucking 46 years old, fighting this 20-year-old for, yeah. you know. And so um, with an engine like, oh, man. So That's a challenge in itself. It is, you know, and they want to beat these guys, you know. Um, it's, it's just such a rewarding a feeling. A rush. Yeah, you know. And so, you know, thank you. I'm not the greatest boxer. Um, so I don't even think I'm any that, that good, you know, but I love doing it. Yeah. Um, Do you encourage your boy to get into it? I know he plays soccer. Um, like his old man, would you encourage Junior to get in? That's a good question and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, but I'll, I'll answer that in, in, in a couple of ways. And one is boxing also um, is how I teach my boys about discipline mm. and how to work for an achievement and set yourself a goal. And live outside your comfort zone, you know, because I think in life if you live inside that bubble, that comfort zone, I feel I miss out on a lot, you know. Oh, yeah. And I feel that you're not testing yourself and you don't, most importantly, push yourself to your maximum potential. Um, so as well as my dad back in back, back then um, driving me, my boys drive me, yeah. And so um, the, my mission in life is to be the best father that I can possibly be. And so if I'm going to tell my boys to get off the lounge and put the phone down and stop playing the iPad and get off the PlayStation, then I go sit on the lounge and just crack a beer open. To me, that's not the right example, mm. you know. So instead I get up and I go running and I come back and I get them up and I cook them breakfast and, right, get up and we're going to go to the beach and I'm like, Dad, I'm tired, get in the car, let's go. And, then, <laughs> and they know, like, if Dad gets up on a Sunday morning and he's got his boardies on, we're going to the beach. Don't even shower, not just get in that salt water. Yeah. You know, I love the beach. And so um, I'm always active and so I have to teach my boys um, and, I, and, and I think I've done a pretty good job at it. So to get back to that, I then teach them boxing as a means of self-defence mm. and they've both, uh, they've both had to use it once um, and they know the rules in my house is that fighting and violence doesn't solve any problem but it's there if you need it and really it's there to defend yourself and also to teach them to be active, you know. And so um, my little bloke Christian, he, uh, he's just... He's just nuts for football. He so mm. doesn't want a bar of boxing. Nothing. What's his favourite team? Oh, Barcelona. Italian team. Um, actually, I, hate it. I think it's. Say Juventus. No, I think it's Napoli because of the Maradona thing. Yeah, yeah. He, he goes right. He just he's twelve years old and he can like. I grew up with it mm. and I love the sport and I was exactly like him at his age and I could name every player, mm. every cup, every and now I've just forgotten it all because of. Yeah. I've just. Did you ever get that culture taught in book? You know the book where you used to put the stickers in? Yeah, I used to, yeah. yeah. I used to get all that and, you know, and I was right into the CDR back in the day yeah. and, you know. And so when the CDR kind of folded, I, I kind of lost my interest in it. Yeah, I think everyone did. Yeah, you know. And yeah. to me that was when I was growing up and that was the golden era yeah. for, for me or football. I think yeah, I think to a lot of football fans it's the golden era. Yeah, you know, and so I used to have to have every Italian jersey there was. Every time there was a new one, Dad, can you, you know, they were never available here. So anytime someone went overseas, yeah, exactly. what do you want? I want Italian jersey. Yeah, exactly. oh, oh, can I have a Juve jersey too, please? Yeah. Yeah. So now they're just available everywhere. Yeah. So, so Chris, they're not cheap though, are they? No. No, now I know why my dad used to say no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah for, a, for, a, for an official one with the side yeah. patches, they're like 150 up. Upwards, yeah. yeah. You know, and back then dad was we'll just, we'll just go, to the, go to the market, you know, Flemington. Yeah. I don't want that one, Dad. No, it's it's to, fake. Yeah. I don't want it, you know. It's been pretty warm. Yeah. <laughs> Almost. Yeah. Almost. So, yeah, so Christian doesn't want to borrow boxing, but he's he's got – he's a pretty talented little footballer. Here. Mark, on the other hand, he's the academic of the family. Yeah. So he's got – he's actually got the brains and the power to do it, but he's just a gentle giant. Yeah. yeah. And so he's the thinker. And, and there's so, nothing wrong with that. No, I love it. It's good, yeah. you know. And so when I, when I see them looking after their diets without me saying so, when I see them going for a run without me saying so, when I see them going for a walk without me saying so, it says to me, it's a, it's a fuck me moment again. Yeah, that's it's discipline like, you've trained. It's like, you know what, it, it's worked. I've killed myself. I've spent countless hours in that gym. You would know, John, and you see me there, but not only that gym, but any gym, yeah. you know. And now I have this awesome partner, Kelly, and she uh, she's a, a fitness professional. I just cannot keep up with her, mate, so... Yeah. She's always up at like some stupid hour going to train about four classes before she even starts a day job. 
Yeah, yeah. right. And so we're, we're pretty we, – we try and be a pretty fit bunch, you know, and um, so – Your relationship sounds exhausting already. It is nuts. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. Oh, that's too much fitness for me. Yeah. So tell me, if, if, for corporate fighter, what's, what's the main sort of – motivation that people have to get into corporate corporate fighter um and does it change once they start yeah it always changes yeah there is no motivation mm. most of them come in because they're gone yeah and they want to challenge mm. they want to lose weight yeah. we get a lot of you know i'm on the beers too much i want to lose weight you know and i think i look at them and i think you're going to die in two seconds <laughs> that'll be me mate yeah. <laughs> and they're like i don't want to be here don't cry, cry to someone else. Get the fuck up and work. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's so. But it's hard. It's a very hard program. Yeah, you know, it is. Make no mistake about it. We we take no prisoners, and we we have to prepare these guys for combat because that's what's happening. Mm. Yeah, um, and girls, and girls. Yeah, sorry, and girls. When I say guys, I think guys is sort of androgynous, like both men. So, generally speaking, but let's be correct and say guys and girls. Yeah, yeah. and so. Um, yeah, the drive, they just need to have that switch in them that goes off and says, right, I'm going to do this, mm. yeah. And so they come in and they sit around a circle and they're all shitting themselves and, you know, and I'm like, ah, look at you guys. I love this part. Yeah, I bet you do. <laughs> I, I love this part. So let's go around the circle and let's introduce each other and they're like, I'm so-and-so and I've got some demons I need to battle with and I, I want to lose weight and I just, you know, my father's passed away or, you know, and, and so all that sort of stuff drives them to do it, to be there. At that point in time, I don't believe that any of them know what's what they've signed up for. They're just <laughs> they're just there. And then I come in and go, don't worry, guys, give me five weeks. As soon as you punch each other in the face, you'll be best mates. Yeah. And that's exactly what happens. And the friendships that form and the bonds that form mm. through that whole process, it, it's actually a pretty magical experience. Mm. And so and I'm not just saying that because I'm wearing the T-shirt. It's, mm. it's because I've lived and breathed the program. Mm. You know, and so therefore I, I believe in it. I'd, I'd agree. I'd agree. I remember I, when I sat around in the corner, I was sizing everyone up in the room, and there was a guy there that was probably my size. And I went, "Well, it's going to be me and you by the, at the end of this twelve weeks." Yep. Um, but yeah, you do you do make a lot of friends, and you know, there's some, there's something weird about to your point about getting punched in the face and then becoming mates. 100%. And it's it's the old it's the old Tyson thing. Everyone's got a plan to get punched, but. I, I remember when we first started sparring, so we were probably six weeks in, and um, and I got punched early on, which I think helped me yep. and, and pushed me forward. But it, did I sit there, go home, and bore my eyes out? Absolutely. Did I question why I was doing it? Absolutely. You know, um, this face doesn't get punched mm. as much as many people might want to. Um, it goes pretty good, John. But but um, but that was probably the best thing though because then you knew what you were going in for and I know some of the people that do the sparring they don't get punched until like a week before yep. and then they that's the wrong time to start questioning why you're doing it that's right whereas if you can get punched earlier on then you can prepare yourself and I, I remember my coach uh, Tanya um, you know she was I remember three weeks out before the fight she was like okay your defence is, is we need to work on your defence <laughs> so I've got three weeks to go. Yeah, we need to work on your defense. Yep. Like you've got some good, got some good hooks, but we need to work on your defense because yep. you're just too static. So, yep. and so you start panicking, mm. and then again you're like, okay, well, am I going to be okay? So it's, it is a real math, uh, mind battle. Yeah. But I think because everybody's there with you, like there's about thirty people in the group. When everyone's doing it with you, then you can have conversations and all that, and it's it's. It's a good shout. It becomes a good drive. It's, it's It becomes a team environment. You know? mm. And so it's just like football. Mm. It becomes a team environment and you end up you end up training for the same reason and, f and helping that person along, even though in three or four weeks' time you might, you might be smacking that person in the face. However, uh, that's the person that helps you get through that session, mm. you know, and that's the beauty of it. And so, um, yeah. And then you've got the good stuff. You're raising money for charity. As you said, you're bettering yourself. You're getting fit. You're yep. getting healthy. Yep. You're training. You're hopefully... Building some nice routines and rhythms and habits. Yep. Um, it's just, yeah, you might have a black eye or two. Yeah, or a blood nose. Or a blood nose. And so that's the thing, you know. And so we, we don't unleash them on each other straight away. We have a build-up program. Mm -hmm. and so they don't start sparring until week five of the program. So we teach them the fundamentals of boxing and then give them an orientation. And then what happens is they get in that ring and they all just want to kill each other because they don't know how to pull their punches or, you know, hold back in the ring it takes some time and experience to, to learn how to do that mm. um, and then 
most of the girls at that point end up in tears. Some of the guys say, oh, I can't do it anymore. I had a guy last night who quit. He quit five weeks ago. He messaged me privately and goes, Coach, I, I can't do this. I've jarred my neck and I didn't enjoy that at all. And I just, I'm not going to spar anymore. And, and, you know, and I'm like, mate, think about why you signed up. I, I know you can do it. I, I, you know, and I wouldn't just say this. If I didn't think you could do it, I, I wouldn't let you take the ring because your safety comes first. Mm. But I believe in you and I want to see you back in the gym. Just come back in and work. You don't have to spar. And he came back in last night. He smacked the guy from Luna Park to the Opera House. You know? <laughs> um, it's a big, big distance. Mate, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, but he, he fought beautifully and gallantly. And like I remember getting him in the corner and he's like, right, how am I going? I'm like, right, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. You've got to do that. I give him a couple of instructions and I only got a minute to talk to him and make him breathe and calm down. At the end of it, I go... Right, you got it. You understand? He goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. he went out there and um, and just put on this performance, mate. That was just electrifying. It's just I'm screaming a lot, so my voice is a bit hoarse today. But um, but yeah, and that's so that's 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 what happens in the gym there. And you know, like John says, you get you get your highs and lows, and and as coaches, it's our job to to keep them there. You know. And so he came up, and and that's the biggest reward for me is when he comes and grabs me at the end of the night and goes, mate, if it wasn't for you. I wouldn't be, you know, and so that, I guess that's the ultimate reason that I so do. So when's the next sign-up phase? Now. Yeah? Do you want the number? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll talk later. <laughs> I think you'd be pretty good at it. I think you should just come in yeah. and have a session with John. No, no, no. John punches shit out of me. No, you won't I'm be. Sure he wants to. <laughs> come, come, come and do what we call a shadow fighter session, which yeah. is fun. You'll love it. What's that? We'll put all your rave music on. We'll put the lights on. I even get a strobe light for you if you want. Oh, bro, that will ring my. <laughs> <laughs> and so we put punch counters and and sensors in your in your gloves. Yeah. And it, it tests your speed, your velocity, your intensity, how hard you punch, um, and how many punches you throw. Yeah. And it's so you just try and beat yourself. Yeah. And it's a good smash session. Yeah, that sounds good. John knows he swears at me a bit. Well, it's because you make us do burpees in between. That's my job. I mean, yeah. that's a satisfaction you get. Yeah. <laughs> and I love it when someone turns around and goes, "You do it, oh, brother, brother." If you think I haven't done what you're doing, I've been to hell and back in this gym, mate. So <laughs> 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 and there's always someone in the gym to back me up and go, "Mate, you don't want to try him. It's okay." Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly right. <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, so it's a fun place. I love it. It's good. You know. So how funny that this all came by from you, from <clears throat> you know running a coffee shop. How the hell did you get into running a coffee shop? Oh, for that I have to backtrack right back. So architecture and design is my profession. Mm. And so I've been doing that for you know, 50 years now. And um, I had my own practice in Balmain mm -hmm. for, for many, many years. And the GFC hit and I lost a lot of big contracts. And, and so the business went straight downhill. At that time I went through a divorce. So it was a perfect storm. Um, oh, that was a lot to handle. Yeah, it was huge. It was a really... Really, really dark time in my life, you know. My kids are very, very young, you know, five and three. Um, and so I came out of the divorce with just a, not a huge amount of money, you know. And I'm not a financial sort of guy. Um, I'm, I'm a worker mm. and, you know, and I'm no bricks and mortar. And so I had a – I did a job for, for a friend of mine, um, an old friend of mine, and he owned this big building in Marrickville. And we'd have early morning meetings at his premises and there was nowhere to have coffee unless you had to go right up the road and I just wanted to get to the office. So it was always a 6.30, 7 o'clock meeting and so I just said to him, mate, this, this little garage here that I'd park outside of, I love it, it's a sitting duck. Mm. So he goes, well, you should do it. Again, like boxing, no, I can't do that. What, how can I do that? I've got this and I've got this and I've got next thing. You know, it resonates with me and next thing you know, I'm, a feasibility study turns into me designing my own little espresso bar and it just all came to me. I knew exactly what I wanted to do with the place and I dropped the DA into council and next thing you know, I've got a tool belt on and I'm building it. So mm. I built it with my own hands and got all my trades in and they did all the specialist stuff and had a coffee machine on there on the bench and food, sourced food and sampling food and full of stuff, doors open. Bang. I remember just sitting there, shit myself, there's no one around. It was, it's the middle of nowhere, the back streets of Marrickville. You know, Marrickville's like the coffee capital of Sydney, just mm. about, you know, they're everywhere. Yeah, they are. There's something like 15 roasteries in, in Marrickville and, and really, really good ones, you know. I've always loved coffee. Um, and so I opened this little bar up and it's a funky little bar with some graffiti on the roller doors and 
in an old garage. So, you know, I used to always describe it as a shitty garage with a coffee machine in it, you know. <laughs> Everyone goes, don't say that. I mean that with love because it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, right. it's my baby, you know. And so um, next thing, you know, about 10 o'clock, I reckon about 25 people walked through the door and it never looked back and it just took off from there, yeah. you know. And then that's where the fuck me moment came from. Yeah. You know, and then so, and it was six and a half years, and what a ride! So you've had no, you had no experience in retail at all. I had experience in designing and building retail. Yeah, yeah. and, <laughs> and I had the structures. Yeah, but I had a lot of exposure to retail. So my 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 design and project management mm. um, career was was all around retail, supermarkets, and and cafes and restaurants and all sorts of stuff. And so I've done a lot of commercial project management. So. So I knew I knew my staff and, and I've always been in and around retail. So I understand it. Um, and, and I guess I understand people. I don't much like people. And I remember my cousin saying to me, why are you doing this? You fucking hate people. <laughs> You've got to talk to them every day. I'm like, yeah, I'll get around it somehow. Yeah. You know, I'm pretty good at talking. So, um, yeah, and that's kind of – that just kind of opened up from there. So, yeah, I had no coffee experience. Mm. I had no – hospitality experience so you went to barista and that's it you're making coffee one day i just went and yeah i'd signed up all press coffee it's oh, yeah. one of my favorite um Roasties. yeah and, and um they took me in and taught me a few things and then i remember like just we got smashed with those 25 people and i'm on the machine <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about intimidation I the ropes. I just the guy was standing there from all press ben a good mate of mine he's like you got, you got this brother you got this what does this button do? Yeah. And, so, so, and that's kind of how it all started and you just learn on the job. Yeah. You know, you throw yourself in the deep end and when I look back at, at the journey so far in my life, that's kind of how uh, I guess I live and I like to test myself. And so boxing was one of those things as well, you know. Um, and so I got pretty good at making coffee and, and then I had to develop some food and a menu. Never done that before. Yeah. I just know what I like. Yeah. So I serve whatever I like. Yeah. And my 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 attitude and I guess my ethos for, for, for the, the the bar was I open up in the middle of nowhere. So if I fuck it up, I fuck up on my own terms. Mm. Yeah. And I'll just close it up and go. You yeah. know? So there was an exit strategy there, of course, from a business perspective. Mm. Um and yeah, so next thing you know, I'm designing this menu and I start rolling ingredients into the next plate, and the next plate. My good mate, another mate of mine's chef, and he's like, Mate, you're doing pretty good here. How would you learn that? Or just I just don't want to go buy another ingredient, yeah. you know. That's a oh, that's a strategy. Yeah. Yeah. So as I've learned, you know, and and all the hospitality professionals can forgive me if I get this wrong, but it worked for me is that I just rolled certain ingredients into the next dish. Yeah. And we didn't have a lot of dishes. Mm-hmm. We didn't, give me an example. Oh, avocado, mate. <laughs> you just roll it into. You can have avocado yeah, and yeah. tomato <laughs> on toast. Then you can have like a a salmon bowl for breakfast with scrambled eggs and some smoked salmon, some avocados, some tomato. All those ingredients were in that previous dish, but you roll, you add one more and turn it into a bowl and you got something else. Yeah. And so, but I, I love food and, and, and I love to serve people. And I discovered that through the bar. And I always have in my home, you come into my home and it's open. Everything's open to you and I like to serve you and, and I love to cook. Yeah. And so um, I kind of brought that into my place. Mm-hmm. And you, so you come into my my bar and you were in my home and that's how I treated it you know and I think that's a testament to its success and you know at its at its high time and so I, I knew I wasn't a chef I didn't even have a kitchen I just had like a toaster like when a sandwich presses mm. so next thing you know I went and bought this like little induction thing and like a soup thing and then so I started making soups at home in winter just to develop a menu I bought a barista in and he put him on coffee and then I started to channel the food and then at that time, I was trying to make a break from the office because I was doing both. I was, I'd go to a cafe at stupid o'clock in the morning, 5 a.m., have a coffee, talk to the guys, run to the, to the office, design a house, go to a meeting, come back from the meeting, go through the cafe, go back to the office. And I did that for probably th- three years. You know, it was just, I was nuts, you know, and plus I had my kids and, and my personal life and going through all that. And, um, yeah, well, it kind of did burn me up, but it made me stronger. And I just had this drive about it that I was not going to fail. I don't like to fail, mm. you know. And um, sometimes in life you have to learn when enough is enough. And that's one of my problems is that I don't. Mm. But I have a never give up policy, you know. And, um, and Where are you from in Italy? 
Sicily. <laughs> it all makes sense now. Yeah, testadura. <laughs> Massive testadura. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, yeah, and so that's how I lived. And then, and then I just thought I had this magic number that you know, when the bar gets to thirty kilos a week, you know, in coffee speak, that's that's pretty decent for a little place, a little shitty place in the middle mm. of nowhere. Um, that's the jump. And so I got to that very, very quickly. Like we got to thirty kilos in, I reckon, a year. Mm. You know, I didn't plan on that. And so. Then I had bought in different staff and I had staff challenges and one let you down and I had to leave the office in the middle of a job and cancelled, you know, I let a lot of clients down. And then I was working late nights to try and make it happen. I was making some errors, you know, in, in, in design and, um, you know, it was lacking. And then so work started to drop off obviously because of um, the GFC. And so mm. I ended up closing the office down and just making the jump and going full time into the cafe. And I remember that day I'm like, wow, this is my dream. It's mm. awesome, you know. Scary, and, scary moment. Oh yeah, mm. yeah. Shitting myself all over again. Yeah, you know, because I, I was like at the helm with the team running that, and I had guys in the office, and um, yeah, scary, but but exciting, you yeah. know. And so, and the office wasn't doing much. The business had gone. You know, there was nothing left. So I was, it, re, it was not letting me go because I was getting dribs and drabs coming through. So, um, the the, the bar was putting food on my table. And providing for my family and I was spending all my time there and you just can't do it all. And mm. so I learned very quickly that I was spreading myself too thin and both of them are suffering. Both of my interests are, stuff, are suffering because I can't be in both mm. and I'm the one. And so I'm the constant so I had to just devote myself to one and, and the bar was, was thriving so mm. I developed that um, even further. Mm. Yeah, and so... That's kind of the long story about how I got into coffee and, and it went on for six and a half years and and then COVID hit. And so next thing you know, I had to manage it through COVID and, um, and yeah, and unfortunately it didn't survive. So how was that? Because in, in Marrickville, so you're not in the, in the CBD where I know a lot of the shops went very, very quiet. Yep. So how was it in, in kind of, you know, in the, in the burbs? Well, I kind of went to... I went into my corner and came out fighting, didn't I? Mm. And I just thought, well, we're pretty lucky because I always position the coffee machine on the street. Mm. Um, and I did that purposely so people could see it and I always made sure it was different. So I painted our corporate colours mm. and all that sort of stuff. And so being on the street and being in a garage, I just shut one door and we morphed into a, a hole in the wall. You know? mm. and, um, and so then everyone started walking and getting fit, didn't they? Because they're all at home, yeah. and they want to get out. So we kind of, you know, our sales kind of increased a little bit, um, and and enabled us to stay open and just just make it through, you know. And then um, as we all started to open up again and life gets somewhat back to normal like we are now, everyone else started to open up around me because they had all closed. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of soaring a little bit, but it was just digging a deeper hole in the background of the business and um yeah and then so we started to lose trade again so we went up and then we went straight down and we we fell really really hard mm. and um so then i had to make the the very hard decision for me to to, to end it you know and, and again there's me never give up and fight to the death and all that sort of stuff and um but i've learned it taught me that in life sometimes you you, you have to just say stop mm. and you have to leave well enough alone i don't know how to do that it's really hard for me to do mm. you know in anything in life, you know, it could be anything. But we just moved into a new home, and this morning the Wi Fi is not working, and I spent like an hour and a half. And my partner's like, Can you stop? Just stop. It'll, we've got all this time. I never see you. Can we? I go, okay, all right, I'll stop, you know. So, but that's me, and that's my personality. And, and, and I guess I, I found it within myself to drive myself to, to do that, yeah. So, so what's next then? Um, well, see, the, the cafe is pretty – it was a pretty magical place. Mm. I, f I discovered boxing out of that. I discovered the fact that um, in life you, you do need to stop and take note and what's important to you. And so I worked out very quickly through that whole process um, that my boys are my number one priority in life, yeah? yeah, and everything in life that I do is for my boys. Every single decision, every time I open my eyes, every time I leave the house – they're my drive, you know, and, and the day it didn't work out with their mother and I, um, that they became my mission in life, yeah, and so 
um, I realised that the I missed. I started to miss design, and I missed the, the building industry. Um, and so I, I, I met a. I made some really good friendships out of the espresso bar, and um, and next one one day I'm sitting in the bar talking to a, a good mate of mine, and he was like me. He was an engineer and had his own practice, and then um, got approached by by a larger company to go into business or to, to start working for them. And next thing you know, he's the owner of that company sitting in the bar. And he's like, I think you should talk to, to Luke here. And, um, and yeah, and so he kind of made me an offer. And, you know, he was trying to work out how we do business together. And I just said, why don't you just employ me, mate? Mm. And he said, oh, sure. Just, you guys want a contract? And I said, I've been working for myself for 20 years, mate. I'm done. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It'd be an honour. You know, and at that time, you know, I'd been through the wars in business and, you know, um, I actually don't think I'm much good at business. Mm. I'm good at setting them up and working and running, but the business side of it, I'm just, I'm, I'm shit. Mm. So, <laughs> you know, and um, so, and that's, so that company's Barton and that's who I work for now. Mm. Yeah, and so the cafe is closed. I've been, I've been there for two and a half years and they're, they're a great firm, you know. Um, big company, offices in um, rural and regional New South Wales. And I love to get out of town whenever I can, mm. so it suits me fine. Yeah, so we've got offices in Mudgee, Tamworth, Bathurst, um, in Sydney. Mm. Did I miss one? Dubbo. Yeah, Dubbo as well. So I'm back designing. Um, been doing that for two and a half years now, and you know, I've got a really good team that, that you know I operate with, and um, yeah, they're good mob to work for. So I've got a really good work life balance now. You know, most of it's work. Mm. Life will come soon. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. And so that's um that's next for me. Yeah, that's the next chapter and um I'm really focusing on that and um losing the cafe was was really hard. It was a hard pill to swallow. Um but I had some closure with it. And that's only very recent, so within the last six weeks. Um but it's um it's it's a new chapter for me mm. and I, I feel I'm in a really good place. Mm. Yeah. That's good. I'm excited about moving forward and um, you know. I no longer have to get up at four in the morning and worry about who's coming in and who's not coming in and how to pay this guy and where's this money going to come from and shit, we're out of eggs and why didn't you order eggs and, you know, and all that sort of stuff. So um, I love that whole ride and, and I look back at that as a massive turning point in my life, you know. So it's a pretty awesome journey. I'm yeah. pretty proud of it, yeah. I think it does give you a different perspective on things when, when you run a business or you've owned something and you built it and, you know, the end if it stops or you walk away or it you know, doesn't work or something but to then go back and be an employee you have a very different perspective on other people within a firm or a business or um you know a company yeah well i, I always think about cost now so mm. you know um as an example i, I have a company vehicle mm. and um you know company's very big on on signage and so the vehicle gets about town and they love the exposure and but i don't drive it on the weekend and so one of my my seniors said to me, "Well, why don't you drive it on? It costs money. I've got my own car. I love my car, mm. but it costs money. I'll save the company money." He said, "Oh, that's a testament to who you are." I remember, got a, I had did work for myself yeah. for twenty years. You know, like I had the office full of people at one some stage, and that you know, at at at, at its largest, it, we had eight people in the professionals. Mm. So I had to bring in hundreds of thousands a month to pay these people. You mm. know, and so. Um, I'd, I'd been through it and I understand how hard it is to earn that dollar and how hard it is to make the end of that month because the end of the month is so important. Mm. You've got to get all those bills in, you know, get them out and get them paid and get on those terms and it's just, um, yeah, so it's um, I do understand the value of it. And you get paid last as the business owner. Correct. <laughs> yeah, the amount of times I'd stayed up till all night as I pulled all night as designing things and, and writing construction programs for massive projects and, you know, just so I could get paid the very next day or put that invoice in the very next day, you know. Um, countless hours, mm. countless hours, you know. So, um, so yeah, you take that that with you and it kind of drives you and, and, and I, you know, that's why I say I'm in a, I'm in a good place because because I get that, you know, and, and I, I won't take advantage of these people like some people do out there to employers and it happens. Mm. It's shit but it happens and it's only because they're, they're ignorant because they haven't lived it. And they don't understand it, um, and I think as they get older, uh, they will. Mm. And you know, with age, you get a bit wiser. I don't know what happened to me, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah, you're right, John. It's, um, you take that with you, and you learn. Yeah. And so, any any fights lined up? Um, 
Uh, at this stage, no. no. It's not out. It's not out of the question. But I'm really enjoying coaching. Yeah. Really enjoying coaching and my, and my own training. Um, you know, I still get to spar a lot, um, and so I still get to test myself. Um, and not, not to say that I won't. I've always said that I'd like to do the masters, and that would be the end of my my fighting experience. I mean, masters is a, a program for for older dudes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it's you, you, all sorts of levels, you know, and you get get in there based on the amount of fights you've had and your weight and you trained for it. It's up in Queensland, I think, could be in Adelaide this year. Um, so I've always said with my coach that that would that would be the pinnacle for me, yeah. um, and then and then I'd hang up the gloves, so to speak. So there's potential there, but um, but we'll just see. So it's uh, yeah, I'll be like Kostya's you. Never, never officially retired. Just walked away. <laughs> <laughs> and he's doing very well. He's got a fight coming up. Um, couple, couple of weeks, isn't he? His son, Tim. His son. Yeah, Tim. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Tim, son, Tim. On Wednesday, he's fighting Dennis Hogan. Mm. It's gonna be a cracker of a fight. Yeah. yeah. Who's winning? Oh man, it's hard to say. Dennis, Dennis is off the back of um, two world title performances. Just such a gifted and talented boxer. He's a warrior. Mm. Um, but Tim has a gift, and he's young, and he's hungry. He's got the heart of a lion, mate. You know, and so I actually, I'm going to say Tim just based on that, just because he's he's at that age and and he's thriving at the moment. But I wouldn't be surprised if Dennis stops him. You know, I think I think the later the fight goes, um, Tim's got more chance of, of taking it. Mm. So just looking forward to it. You know, yeah, it'll be good. And you got to play it all again tonight. With the, yeah, the yeah. So from here, I jump on a ferry, head over to Luna Park, and um, yeah, yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, I love it, mate. It's good. Mm. It's good. It's uh, you know, it's it's really exhausting, um, but but it's just such a ride. Mm. Yeah, to watch these guys come in and they're all got the nerves and jitters. My phone's going off now. I can mm. feel my watch buzzing. But um, all these messages come through from the team and all the fighters. What do I do? What do I last one yesterday? Some guy because do I shave for tonight? Oh, man, there's ca- there's cameras <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> yeah, you like you know, live stream on Facebook. You know, just get presentable. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Just make sure your laces are done up. I mean, well, I thought that was enough, and he came back and said, "But if I shave, I look twelve. It's not my problem, mate. You, know, <laughs> you fight with a headgear anyway." So this, this is the question you want to ask your coach. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, then you get the beauty of questions like, "Coach, private message. How do I beat him?" <laughs> uh, I need to remind you that winning's not everything, and yeah. so you got to get into that mindset. But mm. yeah, so no, no, I do love it, and so that's um. That's happening tonight at Luna Park. You can all check out the live stream. Give them a plug, Corporate Fighter, on their Facebook page. Yeah, we'll, we'll include the link in the show notes. Don't worry. Yeah, thank you. Because I think I think old Italian Stallion is uh, pretty, <laughs> pretty keen. I'd like to see Adriano there for yeah. sure. Yeah, you might. Yeah. You might. I've, um, I've, I'll be honest. I've always wanted to do it. I have, but I just um, you know, I've always got a million excuses of why I can't do it. Yeah. I switched out when I heard. I just um, yeah, a million excuses. Yeah, just get in there. <laughs> Right, let's do it then. Yeah. See, Done. sign him up. Well, you came, you, you came to see my wife fight. Yeah, you didn't come to mine, but you, you came to the, you came to see her fight. No, I came to yours. Did you? Yeah, I didn't come to see her fight. There you go. Got it wrong. <laughs> uh, can't, can't, I can't remember either night anyway, so right. it doesn't matter. Oh, I think I warmed both of you up that night on the pads. So, um, I think you did, mate. I think yeah. you did. Yeah, which was hey, cool. Well, I'll be back in the gym next week. Looking forward to your classes. Thank you, mate. Shadow fighter on Wednesday. I'll see you there, buddy. Yeah. Um, Mate, obviously you are, you're a big fan of our podcast and, and it's a pleasure to have you on here. So you know what question I'm going to ask now. I just want to know who's going to ask it. <laughs> All, right. All right, you got a table book for four. All right. One of them is you. Yep. All right. Um, you can have dinner with anyone. Um, you can invite three people to that dinner table, um, dead or alive. Who are they going to be? So I've been thinking about this question. <laughs> Which shows that you listen to it because some people are like, oh, hey, that's really flawed me. Yeah, yeah. no, and, and, and I've answered it about 25 different ways. Nice. Um, and so, you know, one of your uh, one of your guests said something that really resonated with me and I can't remember him because I listen every week and I mm. get you know, whatever. And so um, there was something about writing your own book mm. and if you write your own book, you don't need anyone at the table but your family. Mm. Yeah, so I would have obviously my two boys, mm. yeah. And so um, I'd have my partner at the moment because she drives me. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to extend it mm. because 
I'm here and I can. Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> it's your dinner table. Yeah, you know, and oh, I'd love to just see my dad again. Yeah. You know, and then I've got to have mum next to him. So that's family, yeah? Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to turn that forward to six. Yeah. So I reserve the right to do that. Yeah. Because I always live outside my comfort zone. So. Exactly right. Yeah. And you've done more fights than me, so I can't say that. <laughs> I've done nothing, so yeah. <laughs> and then, so yeah, and so I, I think family is what drives me and it's always driven me, you know. I'm very family orientated mm. and so my father had the the best family values he was a simple man mm. and so he uh he didn't have a lot of interests in life and so i learned very quickly that his interest was his family mm. you know and he did it really well and he was the happiest when we were sitting around a table table full of food and we're just sitting there just mm. chewing the fat yeah you know so for that reason i try to come up with like you know a smart answer, you know, like everyone wants Elon Musk and yeah. Bill Gates and and I'm like, fuck, fuck that, man. I, yeah. who, who would I have? Like I'm really thinking here and I'm like, you know what? I want Stallone. Yeah, Sly, okay. Yeah, and I stopped at Sly because I couldn't think of anyone else. But his journey is awesome if you look at his journey and how he started it, you know, and what he is today, you know. Same with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Sorry? Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. And then what, anything he wanted to do, that guy's done it. He's just done it. But yeah. Sylvester Stallone wrote Rocky in some shitty apartment and then insisted that he start in it. Yeah. And they said, no, we don't want you. And he said, well, fuck you. You've got to have me. <laughs> and now look at him. Story. Yeah, it's my story. Oh, it's my story. you got nothing without me, mate. Yeah. And he told Hollywood, you got nothing without me. Yeah. You know, and so and I'll probably just put my spin on that story. But, yeah. That's all right. But I'm here and I'm allowed to do that. Yeah, <laughs> Perfect. Well, mate, if people want to find out more about you yep. and do some training with you, maybe just have a chat for yep. a coffee for old time's sakes, how do people get a hold of you? Uh, LinkedIn. <laughs> I'm only on one platform these days. Yep. Um, I, I pretty much stay under the off the radar and off the grid, so social media is no more for me. It mm-hmm. was always a business tool mm-hmm. and I live a very private life. So, um, yeah, otherwise you can find me at Corporate Fighter, mm-hmm. yeah, corporatefighter.com.au. Oh, awesome. yeah. Or at Barnson if you want anything designed or built. Have a look at Barnson. Awesome. And, um, yeah, I'm always happy to have a coffee with anyone and respond and talk their ears off because it just doesn't stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on. Mate. Pleasure, guys. Thank you so Enjoy much. It's well. been my honour. Yeah. Thanks.